Hi folks, over the past few weeks I have been testing out the Z9 you've probably seen. Today I'm actually shooting with the D6 and using a lot of different long adapted lenses. Now when you're shooting with long lenses, having a steady gimbal to be able to take the weight and give you smooth movement is so great, whether you're shooting sports or birds or whatever it may be. I've come out today to my local sports field where they're playing rugby at the moment and I've brought along eight different gimbals that I'm going to test out side by side, plus one. Now this plus one you probably have seen in my recent videos I've used a lot. Uh, I have to give a disclaimer and actually count this one out of the running. This is actually my favorite one, the Pro Media Gear Katana Junior. However, they've recently sponsored my first hands-on video with the Nikon Z9, so I don't think it's reasonable or kind of ethical to include it in a side-by-side -side comparison when they've recently sponsored me, even if I'm being trying my best to be impartial. So this won't be in the running. I've instead got eight other ones, and I'm gonna run through and give you my overall thoughts on each of them. But for this kind of a quality where you have a weight rating that will take essentially any camera and any telephoto lens you can think of, it is gonna cost you at least a few hundred dollars to get one. And you wanna make sure you're getting the right one, so hopefully this buying guide will be useful for you. So through this, I've actually tested most of them already with birds and that kind of thing, but today I'm gonna to put them through their paces, one after the other, so I can get succinct thoughts on them shooting the football. Now, big thanks to B&H Photo who shipped me out all nine of the different gimbals so that I could do a comparison here in Hong Kong. If you're in the market for one of these gimbals, you can find the links to the B&H store below. Okay, so let's do these in alphabetical order. First up with the Benro. This is the GH5C gimbal head, 1.08 kilograms. Nice quality foam, small carry pouch. All the tools and little adapters that you need there. Silica, so the dock comes detached. The gimbal itself is carbon, quite lightweight. This is where it's gonna thread onto the tripod. Pretty much they all have the same format of one locking on this side that locks down this, and then one on the side here that will let this one freely move. And then a lot of them have this docking arm that you can adjust higher or lower, some forward and back as well, so that you can adjust the center of gravity and make sure that the camera sits comfortably on the unit, even when you're shifting it around. Okay, pop this guy on. Given this is all a matter of friction, applying and reducing friction, I'll just make sure that it's given a little move before I try to use it. This one has a bubble head on the level here, so if your tripod doesn't have one here, which this one thankfully does, then you've got it there anyway. So next up, we put the cradle on. Looks like it's gonna load from the top. Yeah, so it can't fall off the bottom. Quick and easy. Comes with its own mounting plate that is nice to see. It has the, the D-ring, but also for an Allen key or a screwdriver. I'll just keep the one that's on my lens for all the ones that are Arca Swiss though. It just makes it that much easier. Something that pops out to me immediately on this guy is something that applies to all um, tripods and revolvers, if we learn anything from lock stock. Heavy is good. Heavy is reliable. If it doesn't work, you can always hit him with it. Weight is actually a good thing in tripods. You don't want it too light that it's just going to blow over. Carbon is good because it reduces vibrations despite being light. And as long as your overall unit is nicely planted on the ground, then having the head itself light, in most cases, isn't going to be an issue. So now that it has a load on this, this seems to spin quite comfortably. When I had it um, unloaded, it didn't spin that well. Yeah, so then, see if like this, you can adjust the weight. So then it's kind of in a natural hanging position and it's gonna stay where you put it, or you turn the lock down 
and then you know it's going to stay there. But by having all of these adjustments, you can be sure that when you let go of the camera, it's not going to suddenly spin and throw the whole thing off kilter. So let's shoot with it a little bit. Um, again, I've shot with this a little bit before, but let's try it again here with the football. So the vertical adjustment on this one is quite smooth. Having this big adjuster makes it really easy to adjust that height. One thing I'd note on this one though, the lock mechanism for the tripod, for the foot of your lens itself, I find it disengages too quickly, like a twelfth of a turn and it's ready to slide. So if you had a plate that didn't have protection at each end or that didn't line up with this one, it could easily slide out on the wrong angle. Fortunately, this plate that I'm using does. But I would prefer it to have a little bit more resistance so that you know, it takes that little second longer, but it's kind of like an insurance policy in a way. Now, when you're using a big and heavy camera combination and a gimbal, you're also going to need sturdy enough legs. At the moment, I'm using the 344L legs from uh, Promedia Gear. You can see it was as tall as me, and I've only actually lifted two of the three segments, so it goes incredibly tall. If you're going to be using gear like this, make sure your tripod is rated to at least as much as the head. I'd probably go for legs that are rated for twice the weight, just to make sure that you're going to have redundancy and there's no chance that you know it's going to topple over. Next up is the Photo Pro. Now this one I haven't used before. Nice compact little unit. Little store, extra storage area here. It's got its own strap. This is the Eagle Gimbal E6H. You can see a lot more compact. So it may have difficulty keeping the, you know, the balance vertically. But you'll note this one also has an adjustment to be able to change the angle on this axis. Interesting. Interesting thing about this one, it's set up for being able to do panoramas. So this kind of is a clicked in degree section, which you can de-click so that it can just rotate smoothly, or you can tighten up so then you get clear clicks as you go to each position. Quite handy. And this guy also has a gigantic bubble level on the center so that you can be sure that it's level even if your tripod doesn't have it. Now a really nice touch on this guy, it has a button you have to push here. If you don't push it, you can only open it enough to slide a bit, but if you want to open it all the way, you have to actually push that button down. Nice big knob as well for making adjustments. So not as smooth to rotate. This is obviously aimed as being a dual use one with that, you know, the ability to do your panoramas. I really like the large locks that it has on these sides, really easy to adjust. But the one down here, I don't love. You see this guy, it's actually really hard. You can only kind of get your fingers on the side to tighten it. You can't get under because this is so low and the adjustment is right there. So if you were trying to do that in a rush, I could see that being a little bit of a pain and I'm already kind of hitting my finger trying to make the adjustments. These are minor things, but when you're out in the field or using it all day, that's just the kind of thing to take a bit of skin off one of your knuckles that is going to make the rest of the day not much fun. Also, it doesn't rotate as smoothly. For some people, it's got more resistance even when it's fully unwound. That could be good if you're doing time lapses, but for doing stuff like birding where you want maximum movement, this isn't as smooth as the others. Despite being a lot shorter in this aspect, it does have plenty of clearance. I think if you needed to move your plate forward because of the weighting of what you're using though, then that is going to potentially hit, although you're not too often shooting something that's right down there unless you happen to have one of those funny situations where a fox comes right up to your tripod and you know you want to get that shot. 
Now this is something you're gonna have to think about for yourself, I can't comment on it, but I don't know the brand Photo Pro at all. I don't know if how easy it's going to be to get service if you had an issue with this compared to one of the bigger names out there that have a whole infrastructure built up for support with different you know, outlets around the world. So this is the little guy. If you undo this second knob and then push this, you can either have it free or have it go to a particular degree setting. Again, could be handy if you're doing a time-lapse or a panorama where you want this kind of a movement. But whilst that's great in theory, you'll note you can't actually get to the 90 degree position because the button is hitting that button. And when I go in this direction, then the plate itself is hitting here. So you can't actually lock into 90 degrees in either direction. Now, as I said, b &H Photo loaned me all of these different gimbals to be able to test out and present to you guys. And this video is sponsored by their in-store payment card, Payboo. It instantly credits you back the amount of sales tax on your order, available exclusively at b &H Photos. So check it out, you can apply for that at the link in the description below. Next up is Gizzo, the rare one that's made in Italy. And this is a rare situation where you're not paying a big premium for Gizzo. Comparing it to the others, it's not unusually expensive. Like some of them, it has the arm if you want to use it in that way. It's good for video, good for some applications. I won't be testing that today. Comes with its own Arca Swiss foot. And you see the finish of it is designed to match their tripods exactly. First thing that jumps out at this one, despite being a metal design, it doesn't feel heavy. It feels kind of rugged, but still light. I think thanks to the mag alloy. The rubberized dials are big and easy to adjust. I actually used this one back in the day when I was testing long lenses burning in Iceland. It has this lip on here to stop you accidentally taking this guy off, but it's easy enough to push in and just set. Worth noting, unlike the previous ones, this does not have a bubble level on it. Now, I do like the rubberized dials here, the locks, but something I've found on Gitzo tripods I've owned in the past, over time, these start to get loose, and then it's actually really difficult to tighten and loosen these once this rubberized track is no longer tight to the knob itself. So straight out of the box, this guy's fairly stiff, but I can tell you having shot with it a fair bit in the past, it does loosen up. And then this, especially on this axis, it becomes a lot freer once you've used it for you know, a week or so, it does loosen up and get more smooth. But right now, she's a little rusty. How you doing? Yeah. yeah. Got the Xenon on you? Or? I don't, sorry. Yeah. Not today. Had to return it, yeah. How was it? Oh, great. Yeah. You're a Nikon tutor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, I've only just been into this for two years. I used to play, so I'm trying to... Uh -huh. I still stay involved by doing something. But, yeah. Okay, so just a little piece of advice that applies to all tripods and gimbals. Spend the money to get what's really going to suit your needs. I'm not saying buy the most expensive, but if you're comparing something that's, say, $350 and $420, for example, why bother saving that $70 if you've got a multi-thousand dollar kit on there get the one that's going to be ergonomic and reliable and robust enough for whatever it is that you shoot. So often I see people skimp on a tripod and then get one that's too heavy so they don't take it off the bus. Or they get one that only goes to their standing height by putting up the center column, which makes it unstable. Or with something like this, you know, getting one that isn't quite tall enough to get to your eye point so you're always having to kneel down or crouch over, which is just gonna give you a bad back by the end of the day. One like this goes so high. Yeah, if you know the mountain from Game of Thrones or you have any NBA friends who are looking for a tripod, something like this is great. And to be able to get up higher or to have one leg longer if you're shooting like on an uneven surface, having extra bandwidth is really good. But next up is the Enduro GHB2. This guy noticeably heavier at 1.5 kilograms, also made in China. And now we're really getting into 
a familiar design. We're gonna see several that look pretty much like this. Okay, so. Okay, so straight off the bat, the dials on this guy, the knobs, are not nice. They're not well built. I don't feel confident in locking it down and they're not easy to grab. The ones on the side are a little better, but still compared to some of the ones we've seen here, it's simply not at the same build quality. Now I'm reviewing these without having all the prices on hand, but I have to assume this is one of the budget options. Okay, worth noting this one does not have a bubble level either. Now, I'll give you my balance consideration once I compare all the prices back in studio, but this is not at the same kind of level and a lot of it just comes down to the knobs, uh, but the overall build just doesn't feel quite as rugged as the others. If you're using like a 500PF or a variable aperture zoom lens, I'd be more comfortable, but with a $10,000 lens on here, I'm not super comfortable. Hey folks, just breaking things up here briefly. If you're interested in learning the art and craft of photography, I have two photography schools that have complete downloadable courses. The first is learn.mattgranger.com with all kinds of different courses on lighting and general photography. Then learn.artnudeportraiture.com that focuses on artistic nude photography. I'll have links to both of them below. We have dozens of courses up that you can stream or download on any device, so check them out. This, but this is the first of the two Obens. They're actually the same, just one has a bit of carbon and a bit more on the price. Off the bat, this feels quite similar in build quality to the Enduro. No bubble level, no stoppers to stop things from running away. Better grip on this one, but then that's a very low quality knob head. I feel like that could break in my hands before too long. So look, some things will only come out in longer term testing. The knobs on these don't feel great, but it feels really smooth and actually quite stable. If it weren't for those knobs, or if you could switch them out for something a bit stronger, especially this one, I really think that this could be a contender. But you need longer term use to really know how are they going to hold up over the months and years. So if anyone's using one of these, leave us a comment below so we all know. Next up is the second Oban. This is the 30C with carbon fiber. It's slightly lighter. That's about the only difference and slightly more expensive. It does, actually I thought it would be a bit silly, but it does look significantly better than the original one in the carbon fiber and does feel lighter. Okay, now let's take a look at the Siri PH20 gimbal head. Okay, familiar packaging. Okay. Carbon, again, they're all very similar looking, aren't they? Tools. Foot that has the dual locking pin so it won't slide off easily. And the cradle. Narrower plate here. Okay, so it feels nice and sturdy. Carbon. Dials are all easy to adjust. Uh, only has the tiniest lock. You can't really have it have a bit of friction. It's either open or fully closed. Put it up a little so I don't get it dragging on my lens. Worth noting this one does not have a bubble level. This is kind of one of the reasons why my Katana is just about my favorite because it has all the features you want. 
good knobs, easy locking, bubble level, all that good stuff. But so far this is looking good other than the lack of a bubble level. And the fact that you can't really have a bit of tension, it's either locked or not locked. So this is one of the few that I haven't used extensively. First impressions are that it's really nicely built. Uh, the dials are good, except that I really prefer to be able to have a little bit of tension rather than locked or completely unlocked. Um, and then the lack of a bubble level. And there's a guy sitting here wearing his training shorts that just happens to be being blocked by some bins, which makes it look like he's completely naked. It's a bit of a funny shot. And actually, having said the knobs are all good, the one to attach your tripod is actually not very easy to grip. It feels well made and it's not gonna slip, it's not going to wear over time, but it's not comfortable to use. Okay, now the Wimbley Head version 2. This guy is going to seem very familiar and no disrespect to the other brands intended, but this is the original. This is the guy that patented, well not patented, but made this look and feel so popular and is the one that everyone else wants to compete with. Very simple in the box, no tools, just the cradle and the arm. Surprisingly, this doesn't even come with the tripod plate. I guess that's what being the, the best known brand in the market lets you do. Now, this is the only one I'm testing here that's made in the US. The Pro Media Gear one is too, but the others aren't. Okay, now the Wimbley is one that I have used quite a bit. Firstly, the Generation 1, and now this, this Generation 2. Straight out of the box, it definitely feels well built, really well refined and polished. Uh, no bubble level on it, you'll note though. These two dials are both incredible. They're big, easy to grip, nicely rubberized. They lock down well. The cradle is fine, not uh, outstanding. This one particular knob is just okay. This one is good. It's certainly uh, bigger and easier to adjust than the one on the Siri that we just took a look at. Um, but yeah, I am surprised that this comes with none of the accessories. Now this comes with no accessories, but wonderfully old school. The manual actually lists all the accessories and even gives prices. I guess not expecting them to change anytime soon. If you want the pouch, $20. Flash bracket, $196. The mounting plate, 85 riser block 30 you can also get it as a side mount version but if you wanted to add those different accessories you're looking at over 300 dollars to add them all to this already fairly expensive overall kit this one does give you the ability to have a little bit of tension between locked and unlocked oh my friend is back So look, if we're comparing it to the other ones that look like this, this is leaps and bounds above them in terms of finishing. Obvious omission of all of the accessories and the bubble level. But let's head back in studio and I'll give you my final rankings and give them all a score. Okay folks, thank you for sticking with me this far or jumping forward to the conclusion. Let's go through them in random non-alphabetical order and I'll give you my summary. Of course, I went through more detail in the bulk of the video. So first of all, the Siri, I have to say, it's actually quite well built. I'm going to break down all of them in terms of an overall score for build and the features they have. So it could be the best built one, but then the dials are really crappy. It doesn't have a bubble level. It doesn't have, you know, accessories with it. And then it would get a lower overall score. So for the Siri, it's actually really nicely built. Uh, it doesn't have a bubble level. It uh, isn't as well built as some of the others. So I'm giving it an eight out of 10, but that's a really good score. The price is $400. At the moment, there's a voucher for $370 over at B&H. Uh, and once you factor in the price, I'm giving it a value rating of eight as well. So that gives it a total of 16 out of 20, which is actually a really good performance for this one. 
Next up is the Gitzo. Now, I really like Gitzo equipment. I was quite surprised, however, at how low this is officially rated, eight kilos. Now, that will take most camera and lens combinations you're likely to use, but it's significantly lower than almost all of the others in this comparison. The finishing of it is really nice. It doesn't have the bubble leather level either, but overall, I gave this one a seven and a half for build and features. The price is 550, which actually for Gitzo is a bargain. It's not at the top of the range. And for that, I'm giving it value of seven and a half as well. So that brings it in at 15 out of 20. Next up is the Oban GH30. This is the metal one. It's fairly heavy. The finishing isn't great. It lacks a lot of the features of the other ones. Uh, the knobs and dials on it are just okay, but not fantastic. This one for build quality, I'm giving a six and a half. The price is currently 250, but they have it on sale for 180 as I record this. So that's actually pretty good value. It's not the best in the range, but if you can get it under $200, that's a steal. So overall, that one's coming in at 13 and a half out of 20. But if you put a higher premium on the value factor, then it jumps up in the scale. Now, in terms of the carbon one, it's that much lighter. The finish is really nice. It, I would give it a seven for the build quality and features. In terms of price, it's 350, currently on special for 250. So I gave it a value of seven as well. So that will be 14 out of 20. Next up is the curious case of the Photo Pro. Now, since I did those days of filming over at the sports field, I've used these more and I had already used them a fair bit already, most of them. And this one really has become a curious case for me. I think the build is actually fantastic and it has excellent features like the ability to click for doing panoramas, the locking mechanism, the huge bubble level. It's actually a really, really nicely built one. And I think if it were just build alone, it would be up there with the very best of them, maybe equaling the top. But once we factor in the fact that there's a couple of just things that don't really make sense, like the fact that you actually can't use this to go all the way to 90 degrees because it starts catching on itself, that, you know, brings up a few little issues. And the fact that it's so low and so compact, it's actually hard to operate some of the dials. I have to actually give it a bit of a deduction for that. Now, overall for build quality, I'm going to give this seven and a half. Now, as I said, that's because of those little issues. Otherwise, I would give it even higher. But seven and a half, the price is coming in at 529 Kind of one of the more expensive ones, actually. But if you're interested in doing the panoramas, then I think this is a great option. It's just got a couple of little flaws in there. So in terms of value, I'm going to give it seven and a half as well. So make that a 15. If they just fix those couple of little things, then this could definitely jump to the top of the list. Next up is the Enduro and you know, having them all side by side, you really get to see things that you normally wouldn't. I have to say it is nicely finished and it's incredibly rugged. It does feel like it's going to do a reliable job, but the, the knobs on it really do bother me. They're just a wasted opportunity. Compare it to the Photo Pro and they're so much nicer on that one. So whilst if it were finished with better final, you know, finishing hardware, then I would rate it higher. For build, I'm actually going to give this six and a half. It's coming in at $455, so significantly more than some of the lesser known brand ones. So value, I'm actually putting it down at five and a half. So that's going to bring in the total score at 12 out of 20. Next up is the Wimbley. Now you can see why this is the go-to in the market. As I said, get the one that is really going to do the job for you, pay a little bit more and get the best one that will just serve your needs. And this is certainly really well done, well thought out, and you know has the shooter in mind. You can tell they've been making these for a while and it's been refined to get to this point. It does work fantastically well. But if I'm going to talk about build quality and features, the fact that it doesn't come with a pouch or tools or a plate or any of the things that the other ones are coming with, and it's the most expensive in the range, I do think it's actually, it's a little bit down overall in my opinion. So I would give this a build quality of probably nine at least, but once you factor in the features, 
actually have to drop it back to, let's say eight and a half. I don't wanna drop it too low because it is outstanding. Um, but then with the price not having all of those uh, extra things in there, the value is just not as high as some of the other ones. So I'm gonna give it a seven. So that brings this guy in at 15 and a half. Now lucky last is the Benro and I'm kind of surprised by this one. I think if I used it in isolation, I may not have been so impressed with it. It's got nice little cutouts, not quite the same kind of cool styling as the Pro Media Gear one, but the carbon is nice, it is really light. The dials are quite good, not the best in the market, but they're really good with the bubble level, with the accessories and everything, I'm actually going to give this a build in features of nine. The build isn't, in my opinion, quite as good as the Wembley, but given that it's close, but it has those extra things in there, I think it deserves that. Then given the price of this is 435 compared to the Wembley being 600 plus you need significantly more to get all of the other things, that gives this a value of nine as well. So if you look at it, all on balance, this comes out at 18 out of 20 and would be my pick out of the eight here. But having said that, it is going to come down to what you're shooting. If you want one that's going to give you the panorama function, then you'll want the Photo Pro one. If an extra couple of hundred dollars doesn't matter to you, so the value aspect isn't an issue, and you just want the best build quality, then it probably actually is the Wembley one. So take a look at them up close in the little, in the half an hour video preceding this, and let me know your thoughts, choose accordingly. Big thanks to B&H Photo for sponsoring this video. You can see links to all of these products in the description below. Note there are lots of different variations of gimbals within certain brands, so I'll link to the exact one that I have tested here. If you have any other questions, please do let me know. I hope you enjoyed this. Like, subscribe, share, all of that good stuff. And now, pack. Get yourself out there and go do some shooting. Doing the research, buying the gear is great and it's part of the process, but it's all to facilitate being out there shooting and I think that's what we all love most. So happy shooting, wish you good light and good luck. Take care guys.